and I'm going to make you co-host so you can see who's in attendance in the audience. All right, we should be all set. Okay, fantastic. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Amherst Design Review Board meeting of August 28th, 2023. My name is Eric Zikas and as chair of the Amherst Design Review Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 5.01 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink uh, of, to the hearing will be posted on the town's online calendar. Board members, I will take roll call, and when I call your name, uh, please answer affirmatively and return to mute. Catherine Porter? Present. Lindsay Schnarr? Here. Pat Oth? Present. And welcome, Pat, as a representative of the Historical Commission. We're happy to have you. Thank you. And Eric Zikos, that's me. And also present tonight are Chris Brestrup and Rob Wachila from the town. Uh, board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use your raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment could also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate that you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate that you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Design Review Board Chair. If a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be discontinued from the meeting. Tonight's agenda includes two items, uh, DRB FY 2024-02, Jones Library, and uh, 2024-03, Sunrays print, uh, Printing to install a plastic sign um, for DP Doe. We'll then review approval of meeting minutes. We'll have general public comment period as item three and then uh, other business not anticipated. I'm going to uh, make a call. If the representatives uh, for DPDO from Sunrise Printing are in attendance, I'm gonna suggest that they present first to save them waiting through the Jones Library presentation because I suspect that this one will go a little bit more quickly. So we do have uh, Robert Salvini for um, the second agenda item, Sunrise Printing. So do you want me to go ahead and make them a panelist? Yes, please. All righty. So he has to accept the invitation. And once he does, he should be rejoining the meeting as a panelist. Hi, Mr. Salvini, can you hear us? Can you hear me? We can, hi, welcome, thank you for being here. Hi. So you're presenting tonight for DP Doe, is that right? Yes. Great, and can you, do you have the ability to share your screen or should I do that on your behalf? Uh, you can share it, yeah, I don't know how you do that. All right, I'll do that. All right, did that work? Yeah, can you all see mm -hmm. my, there we go. Oh, yep. wow, yeah. Cool. That should look familiar. Do you want to introduce the project to us? Yeah, all we're really doing is making a sign that's around 11 feet long, about a foot tall, about a quarter inch thick of a plastic 
that's going to slide into the frame that's already there at the location. So we're not doing any building. We're not doing anything crazy. We're just sliding the sign in and going home. <laughs> that's okay. it. Yeah. All right. And then that is going. Um, yes. Yep. Here? Exactly. Yep. Right there. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, board members, any, uh, sorry, I'm looking for the screen again. Any questions or comments for Mr. Salvini? Lindsay? Hello. I'm Hi. glad to see business going into that location. Um, I love Calzone, so that's exciting. Yeah. Um, my initial thought is to, is the white next to the concrete it's a little bit jarring to my eye um and in looking at the context that erica just showed um i was wondering what would happen if the if the background was black um if you had explored that versus white um i realized that you know the dp dough would need to be inverted so that would need to be white but given that a lot of those other signs and I, I recognize that the high horse is, is not there anymore and it's the Drake now and all of that. But um, I don't know. I just, I, I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts on that. Um, just the white against the, that kind of off-white concrete looks a little harsh um, and what it might look like to have that be black instead. That's all. Thanks, Lindsay. Catherine? <laughs> yeah, I have... Uh... One question first: Is this a chain or or? Yes. Uh, okay, so we need uh, to ha follow your logo and the way in which you structured the sign. I assume that's well, the only thing I was concerned about because it is their their branded logo. So okay. I don't know what we can do about that. I can and, check. With and them. is it under the the top floor? Is the yeah. sign okay? Yep, it's right there. Oh, yeah, right. So. I guess I would disagree with Lindsay, although, you know, it'd be nice to have a little discreet, cute little black sign, but given where it is, uh, I think that for the catching the notice of the public, probably better to have a white sign, although it's going to be a bit jarring. Uh, however, I think uh, if it's not standing out, people may not uh, notice it, so. Can I say something? Please. Uh, I was there the other day, and if I'm not mistaken, there is a whole new sign on the right-hand side that's bright blue. If I went by there to take photographs and measurements the other day, and I'm pretty sure there's a brand new sign there that's really big and bright blue. Yeah, the, the neighbor on that lower level is White Lion. Yes. Or and yeah. I believe they're blue and white on black. Yeah. Um, and I don't have their proposal, which we saw a couple, at least a month or two ago. Um, I don't have that handy, but my comment was going to be similar to, to Lindsay's um, in that I think that a, a bright white sign there is going to pop and not integrate neatly with the other signs and the kind of metal work on the facade of the building. And I'd like to see um, more black, if not a full black background, um, perhaps a, a, a border or something. I, I skipped Pat, I'm sorry, Pat, if you had a comment to share. I, I just I just have to say that my initial reaction was that it's it really is stands out. Whether jarring is the word or not, I don't know. But I also appreciate Mr. Salvini's comments that this is the logo of the company. And so there needs to be some, some um, middle ground, I would think, to tone down the white, but to respect the logo. Um, we're looking to have thriving businesses in Amherst. And so it needs to be visible that people will visit it and 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 purchase calzones but but when i first saw it i had that same reaction and it most of the other signs have a black background i haven't seen the white lion one 
um, the 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 works of whatever that that is next door has a has a blue kind of a royal blue background. So, right. you know, there are mixes of color going on right now. Um, and Mr. Salvini, I don't know. You're working with a sign company. Whether they could do something to. Uh, I I am the sign company. Oh, okay. But I can I can get a hold of the DPDO people and show them a couple of different uh, examples of more black, if not completely black, black. But I have to check with them before I I I, uh, I can find out by tomorrow. And uh, I don't know how you guys work, but I can look. I can I can contact contact them tomorrow and see what we can work out if you want more black in it or all black. I don't know what they're going to say, though. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I just have one more comment. Oh. It seems it seems that the logos are on either end. Right. It's, and so it may be that I'm not a design person, but it may be that those could be squares with the white around them and the rest could be modified. Yeah, that could work, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. And and Chris, did you want to? I was just wondering if the white could be um, gray, some kind of light gray that would not jump out quite as much and might blend in with the. Um, I noticed that there's a dark gray paint on the metalwork, but if that were gray or maybe even a tan to match the door, it looks like the door below this might be mm, off white. Just something that's not quite so stark. I wonder if that would work. Yeah, just tone it down. So I think we're hearing from everybody that you know we recognize that it's a logo. Um, you know that the, the the circle is the is the logo, and that you have a a font, and there's a style there um, for the text. But we would like to see some options explored that tone down the 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 bright whiteness of it so if there was a an option or two that you could run by the dp doe folks yes um then i think that we as a committee could do um, a quick review by email and not need to call you back to another meeting in a month oh, okay what i can do i can come up with like three about three different designs that have different color combinations and then uh, that way, if they approve all three of those, then I can show it to you and you can decide what you like, mm -hmm. if they can approve those. Would that make sense? It would. Okay. That would. Yeah. And I think that this is just kind of consistency for an overall facade that um, is becoming more colorful. So I want to respect that. And I think, um, but also just want to respect the consistency of the, of the whole facade here. I understand. Do you want me to email Rob when I get their approval on different designs? Yes, or, please. What's that? Yes, please. Okay. That would be appropriate. And Got it. Rob, I see you have your your hand is up. Yeah, I so um, sorry. Sorry. Uh, me, Rob. Uh, so <laughs> well, Rob's here today. Um, so I was just going to uh, wonder, does the board have any recommendations they wanted to vote upon? So Mr. Salvini has an idea of, of where I guess the changes should lie in terms of proposing the new sign to DP Doe, or how does the board want to proceed from here? It's totally up to you guys as a advisory committee, because I know the next meeting is not for like a month from now, um, and I don't know how you would feel about voting on something today or not voting. Uh, totally up to you. I don't feel comfortable approving what's here other members of okay. the committee may feel differently about that mm -hmm. but um i think i could encourage us to make some recommendations so we could um ask some ask one of you to move to recommend uh seeing design alterations that um, reflect our comments about the whiteness <laughs> of the sign and there were a number of recommendations so is anybody willing to give that a go i, I was going to say um i was going to offer them a full black background a full gray background and then uh like the 
I can't remember her name, but the, the woman who said the logos in a, in a white square mm -hmm. and, and then more black in the background. I was going to show them all three of those and then I see what they said. Lovely. Is that good? Yes. Ooh, and so that I think we're we're all on the same page. We just need, um, I guess, a, a, a motion to um, approve recommendations. Lindsay? I move to approve the recommendations for DPDO um, to explore the options that were recommended. I second that motion. And could I call uh, for a vote then? Um, all those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Uh, Great, a unanimous. And uh, Mr. Salvini, we appreciate your continued work on this. And I think that we will not need to reconvene, uh, depending on your timeline. I mean, if it makes sense to get together in a month, we can do that. But uh, okay. we shouldn't need to reconvene. I think we can review by email, considering that we've already had this conversation. I appreciate you guys' time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Me. Okay. All right. And uh, representatives from the Jones should be. I have a list of people who are going to be speaking on that project, so I can promote them one by one if you want me to. Yeah, that sounds lovely. I mean, they could all, all be, I'm sure they've got their presentation coordinated, so they could be let in all simultaneously. <laughs> All right, so let me just go ahead we'll and have that. our conversation and then um, have a public comment period before we move on to our meeting minutes and whatnot. Okay. Let's see who else we got. And please let me know if I'm missing anybody from um, the list who I still have to promote as a panelist. Welcome, everybody. My name is Erica Zikos. I'm chairing the Design Review Board. Uh, happy to have you here. I will open the floor <laughs> to you all to present in whatever order you had uh, anticipated. Um, I see a couple of familiar faces. Um, hello and welcome. So I'm Austin Sarrett. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present to the Design Review Board. I'm the, the President of the Jones Library Board of Trustees and the chair of our building committee. And we are joined tonight by representatives of our OPM from Colliers, our architects, Feingold Alexander and Berkshire Design. And we are very excited about what we have to show you and look forward to your uh, to your comments. Uh, I think, Tony, are you going to take the lead from here? Yes, I can do that, um, Austin. And I think uh, maybe Josephine, if we can have you bring up the presentation, then I can yes. begin. Um, and while she's doing that, uh, my name is Tony Shah. I'm a principal director of design at Feingold Alexander Architects. Delighted to be with you all folks tonight. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Great. And, and while I'm doing this also, if I miss anything, which I mean, definitely might, uh, we do have my, my colleagues, Ellen, Jim, and Josephine also on, on deck here, just to make sure I'm covering everything. So I'm just going to launch right into it because I know it's a busy agenda and we have a number of materials to go through. So the purpose of this meeting tonight is to show you what is being proposed in the Jones Library um, design. And this includes not only the, the dealings with the historic building, but the 
proposed addition um, that we are uh, creating for the site. So I'm just going to have you move forward into the next image. So I'll start just very quickly with the existing conditions, um, which I know you're very familiar with, I'm sure. But these are some of the images that look in particular at the um, south facade. And, and these are you know, some of the lovely historic aspects of the existing library, um, to both in terms of material, scale, proportion, and just the general nature of how it sits in this location. And we can come back to these and refer to these certainly as we go through the presentation. And then if we turn to the west, um, these series of images shows as you move around to the side, um, what you're looking at. And again, when we go through the design, you'll see where we're proposing, what we're keeping and what we're proposing to replace. And then as we go towards the north, um, uh, most of this actually is going to be um, proposed to be replaced with a new addition, but these are the existing facades that you have currently facing north. And then finally, towards the east, um, on the other side of the main front, these are some of the details that surround this particular view of the library as it's looked at from this vantage point. And I'm going to actually let um, Rachel take over in terms of the site plans. And there's a number of details, I think, in particular, related to design and materials that she's going to share with you. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm Rachel Leffler, principal with Berkshire Design Group, and have been working with FAA and the Jones Library Building Committee on this, on this project. Um, to orient you for the site plans, um, we, the site, um, we've broken the plans into two sections, what we're calling the south section and the north section. Um, so to orient you to this plan, we have Amity Street to the south, at the bottom of the page. Um, there's an existing sidewalk along Amity Street that will be um, will be replaced as part of this project. Um, we also have a number of Amherst public shade trees in the right of way between the sidewalk and Amity Street, which will be protected as part of this project. Um, there are existing historical society trees on the west side of the library that are on the historical society property that will be protected throughout the project. And then within the library project, there are a number of trees that are either um, slated to be protected or to be removed to allow for the work. So in the front of the library, we are going to retain two Chinese dogwoods, which flank the corners of the front addition, front of the building. Um, but the other trees out, out front will be removed, and we'll show you what that will look like in the new landscape. Also of note in the front is that there are currently angled parking spaces with a drive aisle separating the handicapped spaces from the entrance to the library. Um, this will this configuration will be improved in the in the new design. Um, also today, there's a when you um, access that that drive, um, you would have to drive to the back of the building and turn around. So there's a major conflict with pedestrians and vehicles along the east side of the building. Okay, next slide. The north side of the project, um, so back towards the CVS parking lot um, and the lower elevation of the library, we have um, on the east side that continuation of the service drive with, with the turnaround area that people use, and then the Kinsey Garden area, which um, has been slated for relocation to South Amherst at the Kestrel Land Trust. There are uh, there are pathways that are below, that, that provide access to the back of the library. Um, and then the historical property line shown with a pretty solid line um, kind of angled towards the building. And the, the existing library building actually, um, actually is within a foot of the property line at its northwest corner um, and within another foot of the, the property line on the west corner of Bell. Um, additionally, there's a quite a bit of grade change between the historical society property and this lower elevation of about six, six feet. Um, in the back area, there are some significant trees in back. We'll be protecting the tree adjacent to the utility shed and the trees adjacent to the, um, in the northeast corner. Um, but we will have to remove two of the large shade trees in the back due to um, one tree is doing quite well and actually has grown into a clay sewer line. Um, so that sewer line has to be replaced for the library and also um, that, so that tree has to go. 
and, and then the other tree will need to be removed to support the stormwater um, demands of the increased footprint of the library. Next slide. So this is uh, a similar view to what we're looking before, but this is um, what we call a demolition and erosion control plan. It's what we'll provide a contractor to show them our expectations for how they will manage the site and keep it safe during construction. So during construction, there'll be um, temporary erosion control barriers to prevent offsite sediment, and then fencing to control the site and, and, and manage access for safety. Um, we're going to incorporate some pretty significant protection measures for those historical society trees. The heritage tree, the oldest sycamore tree in town um, is right out front, and then an old um, Norway spruce. So, so we, we will be having the contractor retain an arborist to install protections and monitor the site and advise throughout construction. Um, this plan also shows you the um, protection of those two Chinese elm in front and also the removal of the other vegetation on the side. Next slide. Um, and in the back, the uh, limited work area, uh, we're also um, taking care to make sure that no heavy equipment is loading the adjacent structures on the east side of the property. Um, and, and care will be taken while working adjacent to the historical society property. Next slide. So this is a view of the layout and materials. So this is hardscape materials, anything that you might be walking on or driving on, as well as any site furnitures uh, proposed for the site. Um, so you can see closest to Amity Street, we have the new the new sidewalk where we're evening out the grades uh, with a gentle slope less than two percent. Um, where one of the one of the biggest improvements on the project is um, achieving a fully accessible entry into the main front door. So the the front door and the main entry will be universally accessible for for all peoples. Um, we are achieving that through a, a parallel walkway to the building that is less than 5%, so it is easy to navigate um, without the requirement for railings or ramps. That, that sidewalk then is reusing some of the grant pavers from the existing library front plaza um, and is introducing, uh, we've introduced Goshen and seat walls from that we are also reclaiming from site. Um, there are some steps to connect that upper area of the plaza to the sidewalk. And those, um, which are detailed later, show you uh, have more of a historical character, keeping with the front. Um, we have a dedicated children's area outside of the young adult circulation area on the southwest corner of the building. And then moving towards the east, there is the, the former accessible entry is now for deliveries or for staff um, and would not be would not be used as a main entry during library hours. We reconfigured this part of the, of the site to make it safer um, and easier to navigate. So we widened out the widened out the parking lot and the access aisle to allow for um, head end spaces with two way turnaround. Um, so cars can come in and park and back out and return to Amity Street without having to go to the rear of the site. Um, we've also improved the um, waste management collection system for the library. So we're proposing a fully enclosed dumpster enclosure to the rear of this area. It also helps signal the end of a vehicular zone on the library. Um, and so this area would be enclosed. We have more details that I'll show you about later. And then moving towards the north of the site, we've, um, we've softened the slope of the driveway and made it accessible. So it's also less than 5%. So this, can, this will become pedestrian access that's accessible around the whole side of the building. Also on the west side of the building, off of the children's area, there is an emergency egress way that we were proposing with access out to the Anime Street. Okay, next slide. Um, and then as you come to the north side of the building, we have a reading patio area with, um, with working tables and chairs. Uh, Goshen stone seat benches, and then movable tables and chairs underneath catenary lighting, um, which separates 
uh, kind of creates a new landing for the north entry, which we think will be used quite a bit with this new design. Uh, connecting this to the CVS parking lot area are two five foot wide walkways with the pedestrian bridges over the rain garden area, um, which we, I said during the site, this is kind of like a stormwater sandwich. We have subsurface stormwater infiltration below and then a rain garden on top, so maximizing the area to process stormwater. Okay, next slide. Um, this is our planting plan on the south, clarifying the planting design. So the area in the front, um, we have two areas that are about 40 to 50 feet wide by 20 feet deep of lawn. We're going to introduce two yellow magnolias out front. So they're, they're mid-height trees. They, they don't really get much bigger than 25 feet. So they'll still have views of the library building without the, causing issues um, in the future. Uh, we're going to clean up the front and make it easier to maintain. Um, we're going to remove the lilacs and the rose bushes and introduce uh, rhododendron rose. They, um, we selected a variety that maxes out at four feet and has white flowers, so it'll be nice throughout the seasons, um, kind of giving it that, that historical character. And then in the, in the parking area, we have some shrubs, which I'll show you in a later slide. And then as we work around the building to the north, we have, we'll um, incorporate rain garden planting. Next slide. On the north side, we'll be introducing three new shade trees um, and introducing stepping stones and boulders for seating within the rain garden. Next slide. This is a enlargement of the Catenary Plaza lighting just adjacent to that north entry area. Uh, the section below is looking back at the library, um, at the new addition. So, in that space between the retaining wall, so the yellow line is the actual property line of the Historical Society, uh, which is higher than the elevation of the grades at the library. So at the corner where um, the pinch point between that property and the library building, about five feet, um, there's about four feet of grade change. Um, and then as we move to the north, uh, the, that wall height differences reduces down to two feet. So that plaza area, we were taking inspiration of Paley Park in New York, had to have like a small space that feels warm and inviting. Um, so we're introducing overhead catenary lighting, which is string lighting, um, crushed stone with a binder, which is fully accessible, it has a different sound to your feet, and then flowering vines into the wall. So it has a green aesthetic. Due to the height of the wall, we will need a railing. Um, along it. So we're choosing a railing that's more fitting with the historical character of Amherst. Just that image on the right. Okay, next slide. And then these are some site elevation sections showing how, how we're making that front entry accessible and how it's a gentle slope um, and how that north addition fits in with the existing grade change along the north side. Next slide. And then section elevations to the west. Again, we're gonna we're gonna simplify that that elevation um, and and reduce the amount the round amount of planting on the side for safety and visibility. Um, and in the east, how we're making those accessible connections along the east side. Next slide. Um, when we think about planting, we often start with inspiration photos and precedents. So these are some of the images that we um, we gathered as we thought about the front landscape planting, more of a refined palette of color and texture. Uh, the yellow flower image at the top is the, the what the flowers of the magnolia tree will be like, um, and neat, uh, a mix of evergreens and small bulbs for perennials. Again, trying to find things that require very little maintenance, very little trimming, very little weeding. Next slide. Um, and then this is this is a planting plan for the back area. Um, I think the slides are a little bit out of order, but um, this is the back area planting plan. Um, I'll show you the inspiration photos for that in the in the next slide. Um, 
But in the back area, we are going to be replacing some of those shade trees that have to come down with the addition with some good, really good shade trees that will be able to withstand climate change. So these are plants that are adaptable to southern USDA zone. So it, um, it'll serve the library well long term with the proposed swamp with the swamp white oak and sassafras, which has almost like mint-like leaves and that changes um, has a really good color in the fall. Uh, willow oak has these lovely thin needle-like leaves um, and fringe tree, which is an understory tree with great, great flowers and great for pollinators. And interspersed amongst this is a mix of moss and ferns and other ground covers that do well in, in the shady, shaded environment, as well as a, as a more damp area. Next slide. These are some of the inspiration images that we had for that back area. So again, more of the what you would see at the woodland edge or in next to a stream with mosses and ferns and, and sedges. Next slide. And then this is the, the planting strategy for the front. So we where the those two buttercup magnolia trees are proposed, and then a sour wood tree, which sort of a mid-height tree. Again, it'll probably max around um, around 20 to 50 feet high, but it'll be a good shade tree without overwhelming the space. Um, and then the rows of the rhododendron. And then the oak leaf hydrangea, we originally had a taller evergreen shrub in this area that we heard good feedback from the community that they would like something lower. Um, so we, the oak leaf hydrangea maxes out at four feet and it has a variety of seasonal color. Next slide. Um, and then these are some images of the materials that we're thinking about for the site. So the dumpster enclosure, um, not, not you know, not what you typically you would see, but something that's a little bit nicer and fitting with the character of the library. The railing again that we would have at the top of the, any site walls that require that. And the types of railings that we'd have at those front stairs. Um, the, the crossing for the rain garden area. And in the children's area where we are currently working on uh, stamped concrete that incorporates barred owls and other birds of Amherst that their footprints are, are marked into the concrete that kids could trace with chalk. Next slide. Um, and then out back, the bike rack area, a little bit more contemporary with some pops of color um, and raised tables and benches of various heights to meet ADA accommodate children and then also adults um, who want to stand um, in that back area. Again, pops of color. And then the types of um, seating with the Goshen stone walls in the back. Next slide. Thank you. I'll return it back to Tony. Thanks, Rachel. And that was great. And I'm sure there'll be questions later, and, but a lot to show there. So now I'm gonna launch into the building itself. And we're going to look at a series of elevations. So what we're going to see here in the next series of elevations is taken around different sides, and I'm going to describe what is represented. So this is the front or the existing south elevation here that you currently have. Um, and what we're showing in this instance in the faint pink color is that portion of the existing library that will be removed, which is ticking up to the far left uh, behind the existing front. Next. And as you see in the proposed new design um, that's again represented in pink, uh, what you're seeing here is the extent of which the visibility massing of the new addition um, relates to the historic uh, front building. And in all cases, the, the dominant position of the front piece it maintains its prominence um, in terms of its visibility. And then the new addition, in this case, the heights of the roofs elements are projecting below those particular elements that you can see in this view. As we turn to the existing east elevation here along the side, um, again, the pink area represents that particular wing that is being removed. And here you see the proposed east elevation uh, that masses um, behind. Um, and we'll talk about that in the plans in a minute, but what is shown here is, uh, particularly on the far right, that show the addition that manifests as kind of a modern interpretation of a gambrel end that you're seeing that's projecting to the right. And then all the other massing is behind uh, and beyond. 
Uh, on the north elevation, again, this is the area that is being um, proposed to be removed. And then we have a new addition, of course, which expands outward towards the north or towards the rear. And this is the proposed uh, design relating to that north elevation. We do have a couple of perspective views uh, that will follow, but what we're showing here, it largely consists of um, several uh, materials. One is brick cladding uh, that basically holds the general massing of the new addition. We have a uh, proposed hardy plank element here and a projecting element um, in the left-hand portion and then a standing sea metal roof at the very top uh, that extends and reinforces the modern reinterpretation of the gambrel ends. And then in the notch in between is a series of curtain wall at the corner and the rest of the windows are punched openings, um, again, which will be more uh, legible in the perspectives to come. Next. And then as we move finally to the west elevation, again, this portion of the existing um, uh, addition of all of the uh, pink elements really represents a 1990s addition through the historic 1928 original. This is again being proposed to be removed. And this is what's being proposed um, in place as the new addition. Again, showing the relationship of the design as it relates to the historic fabric, but in a complementary way um, as it scales both in terms of design and language. Again, with the use of predominantly brick, um, shiplap siding and portions of it and standing sea metal roof with a series of dormers that project off the roof in this particular elevation. In the plans uh, that represents what this all means is here we see on the ground floor or the lower level plan, this is the existing uh, plan that you have now. And this is the proposed new uh, plan. And basically there's this dashed uh, line, this dark heavy dashed line. This represents um, to the south and to the east of it, that is the historic portion that is being retained. Uh, and the new addition is therefore uh, everything else that is to the north and to the west that is in place of the 1990s addition. Um, I'm not going to get into the plans. I think there's probably been quite a bit of presentation about that, but this at the heart shows where we're we're taking that fabric. And as we get into this, one of the things that may come up is that with respect to the existing historic fabric, um, particularly along that dash line, uh, essentially some of those elements are external outside spaces. Right now on the exterior walls, they will become inside spaces within the library. But we will attempt to retain as much of that historic fabric as we can as it relates to the new addition. Next, and here you see on your current first floor plan, of course, the, at the bottom of the page is where you come into the entrance of Abamity Street as you currently have it um, right now. And here again, with the effect of the dash line, this shows again the retention of the original 1928 portion of the library um, is outlined there as Josephine's cladding through and then the proposed addition uh, to the north and to the west um, that is beyond that existing historic fabric. Still retains the primary entrance off of Amity Street as the main way into this library on this main level. And then on level two, um, essentially the floor plan uh, has a series of, as you know, is a courtyard approach, skylight in the middle. And here we, again, we remove uh, that 1990s edition with this new edition that's shown here. Um, and you can see how, again, the relation of the historic fabric is retained with respect to that original uh, wing. And then the new essentially builds around into the rear. And then finally on level four, level three, um, which contains some meeting spaces and then some attic spaces. This represents what happens right now. And then the main thing that it, that it essentially changes here is because we're bringing a, a new elevator access to make the whole building accessible. A portion of the elevator does come up and connects to this upper level. So uh, it allows a, a bit to create accessible way to come to this uh, proposed third level plan. So in terms of what this does in terms of the view, so in this image from uh, the front off of Amity Street, the image on the upper left represents the rendering that shows the proposed design in the historic existing photo on the lower right in the smaller insert. So what, what we're really seeing here in the new, new design is essentially a design that it, it tends to complement uh, the historic fabric, uh, but clearly also expresses that it is new. So the cladding of the new is going to be brick um, which is shown in sort of the gray tone there. Uh, and then it, it basically, in the gambrel element of the new design, it manifests as a standing sea metal roof uh, with a series of dormer uh, windows that basically breaks to the upper reading area. Uh, but here you can again see that the main dominance of the historic fabric retains and holds its prominence along Amity Street as one views it from this particular vantage point. 
uh, this view taken from the other way, uh, looking up um, again, still Amway Street, again, the proposed in the upper left, and then the insert of the existing in the lower right. Um, here again, see to a large extent uh, with all the elements that Rachel described with the landscape redesign and elements of engaging the front uh, really retains the historic fabric. And then it's a far right, um, just almost not visible. Um, that is where the new addition becomes visible in this particular instance as one views it from this vantage point in the corner. But again, it still retains the very stark fabric. I will point out, because I'm sure it will come up. So the elevator that I mentioned that connects to the top level, it just barely peaks up right there. Uh, the intention is to really make the colorway essentially uh, to a less extent, it disappears as much as possible in terms of the colorway as it relates to the roof um, and the ceiling of the fabric. So it really tends to be suppressed. And then finally, as we come to the rear portion, um, here again, you can see in the design on the upper left image and then the existing, um, what the real uh, heart of the, of the proposal here is manifesting kind of the expression of two uh, volumetric forms that sort of um, come together. It's again a modern interpretation of a gambrel uh, shape that exists in the historic library. And the main thing about this is that, of course, this also represents the entrance from the north uh, where the CBS lot approaches the building from the from the back. And there will be a lower level entrance here that also connects to the lower meeting space. Uh, the large uh, use of materials, again, is predominantly brick. And um, we're looking at two different uh, tones of brick with a slightly darker tone on the base and then a lighter gray tone on the upper portion of the of the new wing. Uh, to the far left in the white-ish color um, projecting element that is represented as a hardy plank uh, product that is being used to project this projecting bay piece. We have standing sea metal roof again on the roof elements on both uh, wings and then the dormer windows that show on the far right and then in the corner um, between the two volumes expressed is a curtain wall system that allows more transparency and glazing and then again we're showing some of the elements that Rachel described from a landscape design standpoint. On the level of the details relating to this next, um, what we're looking at is a couple of things. So there was a question about exterior lighting. Um, what we're really trying to do in, in the, at the heart of this is that when there are certain, a few historic uh, light fixtures or sconces, particularly around the front, our attempt is to retain those. Um, if there's need of refurbishment, restoration, we will do that. Um, and then if there are certain instances where we're proposing very discreet lighting elements on the exterior face of the building, primarily for um, safety and just uh, security, we are proposing fixtures that will tend to, and we believe, blend into the historic fabric uh, and be complementary to what exists. And all, in all cases, the exterior lighting will be within every intention to minimize any light pollution and mitigate any necess necessary lighting that allows us to fulfill the requirements, but without over, light, over lamping the building. So this is what is being suggested in certain select instances around the, around the building. Uh, as far as the lighting itself on the exterior lighting, um, again, we're looking at a very series of pedestrian lighting elements, which are tended to be both in some instances um, historic in nature, looking at the ones on the far left uh, and then on the far right where we have parking lighting. Uh, again, the idea is to try to be uh, complementary to that to minimize the amount of lighting that we need, but to fulfill what, what's required to provide lighting to the parking areas around the building that is shown in the image on the right. Uh, just in terms of the details, the key thing that we just want to represent is that um, in the in the particulars on the historic building, the intention is that um, we will uh, be replacing the windows, but we'll retain the historic fabric. And what simply changes is that we are going to go to a, a proposed window section on the far right, which essentially has a sash to match the existing fabric and style, but it will be an insulated glazing unit because right now your existing library has single glazing unit, which of course from an energy standpoint, and sustainability standpoint, uh, we need to we need to revise. Um, so that is the intent, but it's really to try to retain uh, to the extent uh, that it manifests a historic fabric, it will in appearance uh, very much resemble what exists there now. And then on the far left, um, what we have in the new windows, and they will be a, a new aluminum a window systems in terms of the design for the addition. Uh, and then there are some areas, as I said, in the corner where we will have a curtain wall window system. But in all cases, all of these windows are intended to be as energy efficient as possible um, to retain uh, the sustainability of the project to the extent that we can absolutely fulfill those requirements. And finally, with respect to these slides, these are just about the materiality of it. So um, identified in, in the upper left image, that's the image we showed before, 
uh, in the circle one, circle two, um, this shows the intent of the two tones of the brick with a slightly darker um, suggested here as a coal colored brick. And then the sort of slate gray brick in the predominant body of the library wing. And then the siding for that uh, projecting element on the left, which is sort of an off-white, is a hardy board uh, panel siding system that is shown in the image on the bar on the bottom right. In terms of the roof, uh, as again, we're proposing a standing seam a metal roofing system. Um, it will be matte finish. The intent is to really be uh, complementary to the slate roof, um, but it is a metal roof and it shows um, various ways that the details will develop. These again are just some precedent examples of the standing roof uh, seam system that we are proposing for the new addition. And then with respect to this slate, um, because the nature of many of the slate elements are, you know, the roofs are at the end of their useful life, or in some cases beyond, um, we are proposing to replace all the slate with a synthetic slate. Um, and with respect to the coloration, details, variation, and size, uh, there is many things that we can do to adapt uh, to make an appropriate scale to the slate roof elements. So these are the level of details that we are getting into, but the intent is to replace the existing uh, slate roof on the historic portion of the library with the synthetic slate, as, as you see here. So I think that concludes our presentation of the design. I wanted to leave sufficient time for questions and comments. Whew, thank you. It's a lot of information to take in, but I think we've all had a chance to look at the documents on our own and um, really appreciate the time that uh, Sharon and Rachel um, and Kent took to walk us through uh, kind of an information session on site uh, visit last week. It was great, so thank you. Um, Tony, could you just speak uh, before we before we jump into uh, the sustainability measures that we should be looking for? I, I know you've talked about the the windows being uh, double glazing that that's in the aluminum and that's a big upgrade. Um, I understand that the building is photovoltaic ready, like where would that go and what else should we be paying attention to from a sustainability perspective? Uh, I think, um, and I'll certainly let others weigh in um, who've also been doing a lot of it. As you, as you know, we are proposing both on you know, the inside um, a combination of steel and CLT construction um, for using uh, wood um, to the greatest extent we can. We believe that's a very um, strong statement. Uh, of course, the energy system with respect to fulfilling you know, the new codes as well as mechanical systems, all of those things will be uh, pushing to the greatest extent that we're able to do on the sustainability front. Um, on the exterior cladding, um, all of those things, again, with the intent to try to ma ma maximize the energy efficiency, reduce the amount of you know, a heat loss, heat gain, and the windows do play a big part of that. Um, but I, I don't know, Ellen or Josephine, others, do you want to weigh in to respond to any of these uh, comments, questions? <laughs> I think I would just add, um, those are all good points, Tony. I would just add that we have a lot of square footage on the roof where the PV panels would be able to to um, be placed um, both on the north addition and sort of the northeast addition portion as well. Um, so, so there's definitely space for PV panels. And as far as P being PV ready, we are incorporating that into the documents. Um, so that way the library will be ready to go. Right. Thank you. All right. So this is a big project. Um, and as you all know, the design review board has some standards and guidelines. And uh, because of the significance of this project, I'd like to move through the discussion um, as framed by those, those standards. Um, so for those of you at home, <laughs> they can be found on pages what, 12 and 13 of the Design Review Board's handbook, which is on the town's website, um, but we'll describe them as we go. And there's a fair amount of redundancy in these standards. Um, I will ask, I will kind of make a, a brief description of the standard and then ask Design Review Board members to ask questions or make comments. Uh, no, nope, we don't need to comment on all of them if you don't feel compelled to, um, but if you do have something to say, this would be the time. And I would ask Rob, as we're making suggestions, if there are any, would you mind noting them down while we're talking? Is that something that you could do for us? And that way that'll help <laughs> with uh, recommendations at the end of our wrap up. 
Yeah, sure. I could do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so the first of the DRB standards is height. This is the height of any proposed alteration should be compatible with the style and character of the building structure um, or the site being altered in that of its surroundings. So my feeling is that the, the height of these volumes is very appropriate, uh, but I'm uh, opening that up to uh, members of the DRB. If you wanna indicate that you'd like to uh, make a comment um, by either raising your hand or just simply unmuting and chiming in, that would be welcome. I have no problem. I think I'm pleased actually that the uh, whole design is keeping within uh, the fairly similar standards I mean, of height. So I have nothing, <clears throat> I don't have any uh, objection. I, I would weigh in to say that I agree with you, Erica, and with Catherine, that there's there's been a very careful attention so that the historic building is not overshadowed uh -huh. by the new construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and the next of the of the standards is about proportions. Proportions and relationships of height to width between windows, doors, signs, and other architectural elements should be compatible with the architectural style and character of the building or the structure and that of the surroundings. Pat, your hand is up and I may have missed that from before, but would you like to start us off on this one? Um, actually, it was up from before. Okay. Um, and so let me let me just pause and, and think about this for a minute. Thank you. Sure, sure. I think that the proportions are very respectful of the existing volumes and their their composition, um, but like while also negotiating the needs of the program on the interior of the building. So where we need a, a big space for the um, nonfiction um, and the um, fiction collections, for example, you know, that that's done well, this kind of collected of accumulated volumes, if you will. So I feel that proportionally it's very respectful. Um, I Go ahead, Catherine. I agree with you. The proportions are fine. Mm -hmm. And and I would weigh in to say that I agree as well. Um, it's, it seems that a great deal of thought and sensitivity has gone into this new plan. Thank you. Lindsay, do you want to say anything on this one? No, I, I would agree with everything that's been said. It was a great presentation and um, everything feels like it's uh, respecting the existing historic massing and um, working well. Thank you. Bye. Super. We'll move on to number three, which is the relation of structures and spaces. The relation of a structure to the open space between it and adjoining structures should be compatible with such relations in the surroundings. <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful, but I'm thinking about the limitations of the site, um, the incredibly tight uh, site boundaries between the Jones and its neighbors uh, to all sides. Um, I think that that's been negotiated really well. And while I am disappointed to see so many of the shade trees removed, I also appreciate that we'll actually see the historic Amity Street facade of the building um, once again, and that's a good thing. Um, outdoor spaces become fully accessible, which I think is really critical um, and functional and sustainable. I love the children's play area. So that's those are those are my thoughts on this particular on this particular standard. I would agree. Yeah, I, I also agree. And I just have to weigh in to say that I think the the tightness of the space has been well executed. And I'm really pleased to see the outdoor spaces to give give opportunity for the patrons of the library to be outdoors as they use the library as well as indoors and to have a sense of community in those spaces. Mm -hmm. 
I also really appreciate the use of, of landscape elements um, for the outdoor spaces and the character that was shown in the images. Um, this may be, my comment may be more relevant to item five. Um, so I'll, I'll just preface with that. But as far as outdoor spaces go, I, I love the, the connection on the north end that um, creates that rain garden and the, um, the slats that are part of the walkway that opens up and the meandering stone. And did feel like it was a question in my mind about the, the angularity and the straightness of the proposed walkways along the back um, or north, north side. Um, some, I noticed some of the precedent images were more of a meandering pathway um, and felt that that may be more in character with the existing landscape. So like I said, this is perhaps more related to the existing landscape and how it, how it relates to that. But as far as how it defines some of the exterior spaces, and I'm thinking about the connection between that, that, those, those, that kind of triangle um, with the meandering stone pathway. Um, if someone could just kind of step off of the path and onto the stones, if it wants to kind of like weave, and I'm sure that this has been explored, but that's really the only, the only thing that stood out to me that wasn't necessarily in keeping with the the organic nature of that landscape as it exists currently. Otherwise, I think it's lovely. Thanks. And I would say that um, we could treat this as a bit of a as a dialogue. So um, Rachel, if you wanted to pipe in, you're you're welcome to here. Like if there's something that you're eager to respond to. Great. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for those comments. Um, we, we did have a couple options early on that had more curved curved walkways. One of the one of the one of the things that we are trying to really emphasize is kind of safety and security and sight lines. So right now it's really hard to see the north entry. Um, the north entry is actually going to be moving a little bit further to the east, so it'll be more visible by that nature. And then we're also really sculpting out almost a bowl in in that backyard area. So the these straight lines and pathways we imagine to be desire lines for for people moving and then also really just to have a really good sight line for visibility to that back door after hours um, and the hope is that those stepping stones and pathways and meandering plantings kind of bring that softness to the area um, but that, that was our thinking thank you all right let's move on to um four and i think Lindsay spoke a little bit to five, but let's uh, pause a minute on, on four, um, which is shape. Again, some redundancy here, but the shape of the roofs, windows and doors and other design elements should be compatible with the architectural style and character of a building or site and that of its surroundings. Um, and I think clearly, yes, the kind of contemporary take on the mansard roof, um, contemporary shapes and materials is very respectful, but feels also very now, very 2023. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of also provides for uh, photovoltaics in the future by having uh, some uh, clear roof lines up above the, the window plane. Um, and I feel that the shapes are appropriate to the, to the building. I would just second that. I, I really appreciate the interpretation of, of the roof, of the spark roof forms. I especially, I especially like the, um, the way that the dormers are interpreted, um, and the way they kind of pop from the, from the metal roof. So um, I thought that was, that was pretty well, well done. Okay. Right. Well, let's move on to landscape. Um, any proposed landscape development or alteration should be compatible with the character and appearance of the surrounding area. Landscape and streetscape elements, including topography, 
plantings, and paving patterns should provide continuity and definition to the street, pedestrian areas, and surrounding landscape. So Lindsay kind of kicked off this conversation by talking about the pathways in the back. Um, and I think if I have, well, I'd, I'd like to begin by saying, I think that it's uh, very respectful. I really appreciate the accessibility um, and the, the kind of math really <laughs> that's been done to make that work, like a, a fully accessible front entrance to the Jones. That's amazing. Um, using um, and also really thoughtful about color of the plantings, height of the plantings, um, native adaptable, climate adaptable plantings, the rain gardens, like really thoughtful um, and respectful. Uh, on the For the north entry and the way that we do have that pinch point, I'm wondering about whether the gravel with the binder is going to be actually problematic there. Like, do you want you, to anything we can do to make that entrance feel wider, and perhaps by extending the paving to the retaining wall. And I'm thinking also things like snow removal and just kind of convenience for maintenance sake. I I wonder if that would be. Um, would kind of signal the importance of that entry because that will be the primary entrance for the community after hours, right? Yeah. Um, so that's one thought that I have and I um, will share the floor here with my colleagues. I did have um, a sort of a question and well, first of all, kudos to Berkshire Design for this amazing, um, landscape and sort of rescaping of everything. It's just, uh, we're so lucky to have a group like this that could present that kind of a plan. I, I brought this up before, Rachel, and I was, I'm just sort of mourning the demise of that very large tree in the back of the Jones that is somehow uh, roots are getting into the drainage. So just as a wild thought here, was there, did you all consider re, um, not removing, but moving the drainage so the tree could remain? Or is there just too many roots? Because um, it is looks to me to be a very magnificent tree and we can't afford to lose many trees in town. So just one more time <laughs> for my sake. Uh, could you uh, elaborate a bit on that tree? Sure, yeah, it, it is it is magnificent. Um, there are two factors that are that are um, making it a little at risk, even though it looks very healthy. Uh, one is the the roots growing into the sewer lines, as I mentioned, but also the new addition is actually within half of its root ball. Um, so that tree, has pressure both underneath and, and on the side. So it, um, we talked with Alan Snow at length uh, when we first walked the site with him to see if there was a way that we could possibly save the tree. Um, and he said it would be extremely cost prohibitive and that the, the reality of that tree living, even, even you know, doing all sorts of air spading and cutting, it, it would not, it would not be, um, it would not be, um, right. and that could be guaranteed. Um, <laughs> And then in terms of the stormwater, um, that piece, so there's a second tree next to that tree that's impacted by the stormwater. We've, we're, um, the regulations have changed and I think it's good. We're seeing more intense rainfall. We're seeing more rainfall throughout the year. And um, when we deal with stormwater, we're required to calculate balancing the rainfall events and the amount of water leaving the site as it is before the project happens. So our engineers, create a model of the site and anything in its watershed upslope that might be contributing um, and models out what those flows are and they can simulate different amounts of rainfall. So like a four inch rain event, they can model that out. The standard used to be around six or seven inches would be the equivalent of a hundred year storm. So that would be major flooding and, and areas prone, prone to flooding. Um, and we, we balance pre and post flows for that as a standard, um, as a good best management practice. Um, 
the standard has changed. The climate has changed so much that regulations changed in the last year and that we're we're held now to 11 inch rainfall events. So we're balancing pre and post flows for 11 inch rainfalls. That's the new 100 year standard. Um, given the increase of impervious surface on site with the increased uh, roof area and then that increased volume amount, we need some place to store water before we before it leaves the site. Otherwise, it will cause downstream impacts to the municipal system. Um, so that area, that the area where the tree is being removed, is going to be really beneficial um, for for the for not only the Jones Library but also the areas down slope of the library. Um, that water goes through the fire department alley and on down um, North Pleasant Street, which is already having some issues with with drainage. Also, I would say that the Jones Library back area was interesting in that exercise. We are receiving stormwater from the Historical Society property. So it's not just stormwater from the Jones Library property that we're managing. We're managing existing flows coming from the Historical Society property onto the library property. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Erica, you're muted. Sorry, my dog was barking. Pat, would you like to share any thoughts on uh, the landscape design elements? I think the thoughts that have already been shared are, are important. Um, I I like the idea of, of the possibility, of, even just the, the illusion of it with landscaping, of having the straight lines less so. I understand that to the to the North, north entrance that it's security issue as well so that it's well lighted and and visibility is is there but but i'm wondering if landscaping can give the illusion that they're not so straight yeah i, I think that'll help soften them um we could also look at introducing slight curves as long as long as the desire lines which are lying um is still held so we we can play with that a little bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you rachel sharon yeah i just wanted to say um uh staff we we were recommending uh the the, the straight lines not only for uh, to have less sidewalk to have to plow snow blow that kind of a thing but also we know that um just because we see it, people, a lot of people are just walking from the CVS parking lot to the center of town and they're looking for a straight path. And we just wanted to make sure that um, they called goat paths. Is that what, I, what I've learned? We didn't want people walking through where we didn't want them to be. So that's why we were going with the straight line. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And I, I think a, a number of the precedent images suggested some kind of like stones in the landscape and maybe the, the kind of primary and secondary pathways are closely related so that one could easily step off the, the straight line and kind of do the meander um, if they if they so wished. Um, I had another landscape thought and this one is about um, the front. I, kn I know that there's a there's a strategy of kind of like this monolithic plantings, um, that's the wrong word, like kind of sing single um, varietal plantings in the, the hedgerow of hydrangea between the parking and the library lawn, front lawn. Um, I, I, saw, I wonder if four feet is actually too high. And one of the things I'd like to invite you to study is standing on the sidewalk because it slopes down, I worry that the kind of optics of accessibility might be blocked by a four foot hedge. Um, and so maybe there's an opportunity to mix in something that's a little bit lower as you come closer to the street edge. Um, it's it's a thought and it's one that I haven't tested by standing on the site, but I, I did wonder about that. Um, and I'm also, very interested in making sure that there's adequate pedestrian lighting for people to feel safe. And I know that we're negotiating with, um, you know, 
lighting levels and dark sky wishes and things like that. But again, um, accessibility, especially like in the dark winter months uh, for that north entrance, um, I think is going to be a, a popular place to, to be coming and going to community events. And I think that people with their parking in the back want to ensure that they feel extremely safe. Yeah, we can, we can look at the planting um, and then the lighting. Um, we're definitely working through photometrics right now to make sure that we have safe, visible levels along that walkway. Yeah. Great. I have one more um, question. Melinda's hand is up, but as a member of the public and not a panelist, we should probably wait on that unless Melinda's part of the design team. I don't. No, oh, hand yeah. hand. Okay. So she's. I All just right. one more comment on the yeah. um on the south end um. I was, I was curious, Rachel, maybe you can, I don't remember us talking about this, but um, on plan right, where the book drop, relocated book drop is, there's the walkway that goes straight back to the um, staff entrance. And then there's the curved block that goes toward the ramped um, main entrance. And then there's the pavers that has the signage in that triangle. Um, I'm curious why why create why create such kind of a, a an expanse of paving there versus mirroring what's on the left side that's a little more subtle that also has kind of the curved entrance toward the that kind of like perpendicular ramped or sloped walk. Um, and I I don't necessarily mind that there's kind of this triangular triangular space of pavers with a sign there. But it does feel like there's a really wide area of of sidewalk that that feels a little bit maybe redundant in a sense. And I don't have a real problem with it. I just I'm just curious if there was a way to maybe merge those two and make it feel more in proportion to the left side and left side um, while still kind of like giving a presence to that signage or or rethinking that to some extent. So it's a subtle thing and not super critical, but just a thought. Yeah, I, I think I think we can definitely look at that. Um, I think we were uh, accommodating, you know, two different different pathways and different routes across trying to get to the main entry or um, coming from the parking lot or going up to the access area. But you know, we can rethink that that intersecting triangle um, and and maybe apply something more like on the left. Um, also, if we if we have a place for that that other other stuff, so we can definitely look at that. We might give a little more space to the we'll give a little more space to the green area, which I know gets really active. So yeah. My last question on this one um, is, I'm referring to the the first of the renderings that's in the in the package. Um, where we're looking at the kind of looking at the what's uh, southwest corner of the building and the 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 historical society's Norway spruce has been trimmed and I'm just wondering and hoping that that is for the sake of the drawing so that we can see the building behind. It, and, it is uh, an artistic license to clear the visibility to the drawing. You actually makes the new addition even less visible when the right. trees fully limbed up the way it really is. Now that was artistic license. Okay, thank you. Glad for that. I think a number of people will be pleased to hear that. Um, any other thoughts on landscape, Catherine or Pat or Lindsay? No, I'm I'm good with the presentation. Thank you. And with our okay. questions. Great. So where are we? The last statement that it was just beautiful the way that you know everything that you put in your presentation. So um, it's very exciting to see. Fantastic. All right, so moving on to item six, which is scale. The scale of a structure or landscape alteration should be compatible with architectural or landscape design style and character and that of the surroundings. It goes on a little bit, but I think that this has been largely covered in other comments. 
um, I have little to say here. I think you've done a nice job. I really like the way that the um, the entrance is marked with the glass box. Um, I don't know that it's scale per se, but I think that there is something about the way that um, you know the entrance is marked on the back and and thinking about it being somewhat eclipsed by the by the property lines being pinched there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I don't know that I heard anyone speak to that space being lit. Um, but I think that that has a lot of potential to be, um, sh you know, showcased and really pull people in visually. Um, so I think that in terms of the massing and the way that those two um, more traditional forms come together at that glass box is going to be really striking. I think that leads us really nicely into number seven, which is directional expression. Building facades and other architectural and landscape design elements shall be compatible with those of others in the surrounding area with regard to the dominant vertical or horizontal expression or direction related to use and historical or cultural character as appropriate. I personally love the, the big house, little house, back house, barn references here again they kind of accumulated over time typology um and I think you've done a really nice job of maximizing daylight and views without it looking like a glass box except where right that back entrance is a, a kind of a connecting glass volume and I think um that feels really appropriate the horizontality of the brick I think is really um referential to neighboring uh, buildings and their clobbered um, or brick facades. And the proportion of solid and void seems consistent with the neighboring buildings as well. Erica, I would agree with your comments. Um, I, I think it's been, the plans have been very well thought out and the presentation beautifully um, organized for our, our, our benefit and the benefit of the town. Mm -hmm. Catherine, any thoughts on this one for Lindsay, of course? No, I agree with you. Great. All right. We are making progress. There's two more points that we're going to move through, and then we'll obviously have time for things that didn't get included. Um, number eight is architectural and site details, uh, including signs, lighting, pedestrian furniture, planting, paving, materials, colors, textures, grade shall be treated so as to be compatible with the original architectural and landscape design style of the structure or site um, and preserving character etc cetera, etc cetera. um so um you know this this covers a lot of ground um you haven't presented signage tonight i suspect that you'll be back um on a future date for us to address uh those elements but um you know we talked a little bit about lighting and i think that that's consistent um uh, with the existing historical lighting features of the building um and in the kind of surrounding area, um, in that historical typology. I think that the proposed railings are a huge improvement over the 1990s yeah. rails that are there. Um, I worry a little bit about the kind of the the neutrality, if you will, of the of the lighter colored brick, especially. And we saw such a tiny sample of it in the in the image. And I the stone is there's so much variety and and texture there that I think if we have these massive, not massive, these large expanses of the lighter brick. And I'm wondering if um one of the architects could speak to the you know, the character of the the material. Sure, I can start and um others can so uh, it's a great question, Erica. I mean, we are in the process of fine tuning and tweaking the samples. We hope to get out there soon on site so that everyone can look together. I, I think we felt 
um, that the lighter brick, we were trying to be complementary, but not to compete. And, and you're absolutely right. The historic building is so rich um, in the variation of the stone that we thought anything we attempted to get too much could water that down. So in, we're purposely creating a more, in some ways, neutral feel. We want to pick up the warm tones that we think are going to complement. But because there's so many sub variations in the existing stone between beiges and grounds and tans and you know cream, I mean, there's all sorts of that you could literally pick. Well, that sample on that piece of stone looks like this, so it, it becomes almost an endless choice. So rather than trying to um, overemphasize those choices, we were trying to create background. But mm -hmm. I don't know, Alan or Josephine, you others went away in on that. No, I. I think, Tony, you're right, and, and that's what I would say the same thing. It's just we're trying to keep the addition quiet because the the historic building is so lively with the stone color. I really respect that challenge of finding the, kind of the perfect material, but I, I do think of this, the tiniest bit of variation in the color would be... Yeah, no, we will absolutely study that, um, Erica, and we're still studying that, yeah. And I do appreciate the kind of the um, the base course, right? Kind of like striking that datum and having a darker color below and a lighter color above. Thank you, Lindsay. Please, was Catherine hand up? Go ahead. Go ahead, Lindsay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I. I think um, my only question, and I apologize if it was stated, um, but it's around the canopy over the north entrance. Did you talk about materials for that? I see it on the proposed north elevation. It looks, maybe there's not a canopy. Um, there's a wider band that looks like I would Um, yeah, they, so, I, we, we can talk about that. I, Justin, do you want to weigh in on what the materials are in the canopy that's in the north entrance? Sure, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we you're, you're correct, Lindsay, we didn't actually touch base on that, but it is going to be a solid material. Um, we will have down lights in the canopy, um, and I don't think you could quite tell from the plans, but um, it extends the whole length of that, um, of that width of, um, of glass um, at the entry point. Mm -hmm. So it won't be a glass canopy as, you know, initially, I think there were some renderings that were out there, but it will be solid. Okay. It would, um, it would be helpful to see an elevation of that because it is really a, a very important moment um, in terms of the entrance on the north side and um, the way that it integrates into that corner because it is kind of notched. Um, so um, maybe at some point it would be helpful to see how that develops and I'm sure it's still in the works, but um, just in terms of how the canopy is supported, how it's expressed, where it meets, all those all those components. That's one question. The other is at the pinch point, um, I see on the plan that there's, you know, there's some seating that's really well reflected in the precedent images of the landscape. Um, and there's the retaining wall and then it looks like there's a change in material, um, which I think is noted from the pavers to perhaps some kind of piece stone or something, Rachel, I'm not sure. But um, it feels like maybe there's an opportunity there in terms of details of that retaining wall to create some kind of, I, mean, I love the steps that you've created that go around the corner toward the historic um, side, um, property side. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity at that pinch point to create something that isn't just a corner, that's something that integrates the wall into whatever happens at the ground plane, um, whether it's stepping or just something that kind of makes it makes it feel more object-like and less corner-like. So that's just a, a thought. Um, and then also along that wall, I wasn't sure if there's intended to be a bench where the wall moves to the west, kind of the dog leg out to the west where there's tables um, that go up, go toward the stairs. Is that intended to be essentially a bench, a, seat, a bench area for people to sit along the wall? Or is that just a change in floor material? Yeah, so, so the north side of that 
the north side of that small triangular mm -hmm. trapezoidal plaza area. Uh, that that's actually a, the planting bed for for the climbing vines, the flowering vines. Okay. And in that area, we have we're showing five of those uh, cafe tables and chairs that would be removable underneath the catenary lights. Mm -hmm. And then Catherine, yeah. thoughts on the details? Yes. Um, well, first, I have to admit, as many times as I've come in to, from the CVS parking lot into the Jones Library, I never noticed that red brick. And when I saw that red brick on the back, I said, how do they get away with that to begin with? It's so inappropriate in my thinking to the nature of the, in the historic aspect of the Jones, but never mind, that's going. Um, I'm I'm not reacting positively to the brick that is currently being uh, considered. And I, I know this is still under uh, negotiation, but I'm particularly wondering about the east side and the new addition hard by the uh, older side with the stone. And I wonder, maybe it's color. I wonder if something pure white would somehow, I don't know, give the feeling of the age and the style of the building or whether uh, could be hard board siding on that side uh, to avoid the conflict with the stone. Because um, I think everybody is sort of thinking do we really have the the right color? And I so I wonder instead of trying to do a variation of color, if if it could be if white would be uh, uh, considered, and maybe that would I don't know it would please me, but I don't obviously I'm not the person making those decisions. So that's my my uh, thought about the uh, uh, material. But then uh, one of the last slides you showed was the parking, the drive and the parking. And that perked me up because there is no way in that there is that much space for the driveway and parking. Uh, I just feel like it's inaccurate and that somebody should go back and adjust it because I mean, what a miracle that all of a sudden we have this wide driveway with also places to park. I don't believe it. Uh, and uh, if, if it's accurate, that's wonderful, but I don't know how we how we got there. Again, it could be my impression, but those are my thoughts. Thank you very much for your comments. I think we can take uh, we'll take it for this study. Uh, with respect to the rendering views, um, Catherine, we the render is using from photographs directly, and that's why we're showing the before and afters. Um, you know, with respect to the the photography, I mean, that's, but it, I mean, it is literally based on a, you know, it's based on an actual photograph. Um, so that's all I can say at this point, but thank you for your comments. Your renders don't show gutters or downspouts. Is this, is this part of the design or you have some other way to channel water off the roof to your collection areas? Uh, no, the intention will be to retain um, the downspouts and gutters, especially the upper ones. Um, I think in the rendering, some of, sometimes some of those small details may have been left off in the nature, but what exists, in, especially on the historic portion, yes, there still has to be need for downspouts and gutters. I know that they, they're they not always the nicest things to look at, but kind of thoughtful placement, and I'm not suggesting you're not being thoughtful about them, of course, but, um, you know, it does sometimes changes how we look at a corner, right? Yes. Um, and Pat, any thoughts from you on the, on the details aspect of things? I, I think the questions you've all raised are ones that I would 
I, I appreciate. And I think that we're waiting to have some answers back about some of those things. So um, I, I don't know that we're going to resolve that this evening. Fair. Fair enough. Um, so shall I move on then? The last, the last one is on signs. Um, and since uh, the signage proposal is not included in this package, I think we can probably put it on hold um, in thinking about uh, wayfinding on site, marking uh, entrances and um, kind of general Jones. And I know uh, there's some conversation about a, a book drop at the front of the building. <clears throat> it seems like that's not part of tonight's conversation um, and we could revisit that in a second in a second meeting. Um, does anybody on the DRB, do any of the committee members have some comments that you weren't um, you couldn't incorporate into those design review board standards that you'd like to raise up for the design team now? Okay, great. Um, thank you all for such a comprehensive uh, view into the new design for the Jones Library. Um, it was really wonderful to spend some time with the drawings and I know how long this project has been in the works, so it's exciting to see it move forward. Um, we had a number of comments and I'm wondering if Rob, you're able to kind of report back to us. And what sure. my hope is, is that we can have a motion to approve mm -hmm. what the, the outcome of this conversation should be a motion to approve with some recommendations. So did you board. want me to, um, I guess, read over my list that yeah. I wrote down? So, okay. And then we'll try to, wrestle that list into um, a, a, some clear recommendations. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I noticed there were comments that were given that were also answered by the applicants. Yes. So I kind of focused on the comments that didn't have specific answers given to, to the design review board. There are items that I guess should be addressed. Uh, so the first one I noticed was the point that Lindsay brought up regarding the uh, pathway in the back of the library. I believe it was too straight um, and she suggested maybe exploring the idea of making it more meandering um, and then also working with the landscaping to accommodate that as well. Um, that, and that was kind of like the first point I noticed. Um, the second one dealt with the pinch point around the back. Um, uh, somebody had mentioned that there's like a gravel with binder uh, course on the ground there. And uh, I think it was you, Erica, who had mentioned that might be too constraining. Uh, so maybe exploring ways to make that entry feel wider than it's being proposed in the plans. Um, and that was my second point. The third point I had dealt with the uh, hydrangea hedgerow being too high at four feet and how that might be blocking optics of accessibility and whether it might be wise to shorten that slightly. Um, next point is... Uh, it might have been difficult for me to understand this one, Lindsay, because you brought this one up uh, in case you want to clarify. But uh, this intersecting triangle, I believe it was at the front entryway, uh, the south side of the library, um, whether it makes sense to merge those two pathways to give more space to the green area. And I'm not sure if it was like a specific side. If you're looking at like the front of the building, was it like the part to the left? Where those two parking paths kind of intersect? The parking side. That's the parking right. side. Mm. Okay. So um, I guess combining those pathways, the intersecting part to give more area for green space. Um, and that's kind of the way I interpreted your comment. I don't know if I'm if I'm capturing that correctly. Yeah, and it's it's just something to explore. There may be okay. um, you know, it's not a it's not a um anything critical, but just something to look at. Okay. Um and then next I have in the external uh features category um so eric i believe you had talked about the neutrality of the lighter color brick being concerning to you um 
and you suggested maybe slightly altering the color and experimenting with that might be a, a good choice uh, to consider. Um, I believe Lindsay brought up, um, I don't know if this is a suggestion or recommendation that DRB wants to make, but it, it pertains to the canopy at the north entrance of the library. Um, whether seeing like a like a final rendition of that would be helpful. I don't know if the board wants to make that an official recommendation or if that's more just of a suggestion for the applicant moving forward, but I, I took note of that just in case. Um, Lindsay had mentioned eliminating, um, I don't know if it was a retaining wall or if it was just the actual wall of the building, but it creates like a corner at the pinch point and uh, whether they can integrate that better so it's less of a corner, but I guess fits in better with the flow of the site. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I, I don't wouldn't I mean I think it's necessary for the wall to be there, but just if there's a mm -hmm. way to work with the design of that corner to make it integrate to the landscape. Okay. And then the last that I wrote down, um, and I think Catherine brought this point up was um maybe exploring on the east side a different material or brick color scheme to make it blend better with the historic stone of the original building. Um, and I don't know if that one could be related to one of the earlier points that I talked about, but that was kind of like the last major recommendation that I noticed. So that, that was kind of like my list from that discussion. Uh, was there anything that I might have missed from members of the board that, w that you want to include? The only thing, only recommendation of mine that I feel was missed was just, um, and it sounds like it's already being done, obviously, uh, really studying closely the lighting levels on the north path um, to make sure that people feel really safe at night. And uh, Catherine's and my comments, we kind of have different opinions, but I think they both fall under the um, looking at options for the color of the of the brick. So um, are you talking about um, lighting levels on the north path? Um, are you suggesting that they should be are you suggesting they might be too bright or do you think it's not bright enough for the site? I'm worried that it's not bright enough. Okay. Noted. So uh, just a quick um, conversation. I'd just like to feel really comfortable that members of the board feel that their comments have been integrated. If Rob's list becomes our reference list of recommendations for design items, features for Feingold Alexander and uh, Berkshire Design to continue to explore. Um, do you feel that your ideas are, are represented in that list? Pat? I, I think the ideas that everyone um, has has raised are incorporated in that list. There's a little bit of overlap, and and I think that's fine because they're they're the overlap is is not necessarily. Um, we still need to make the the issues distinct, and and so I I from my perspective, I think Rob covered everything. Thank you, and Catherine. I'm I'm satisfied that. We've got everything down. Okay, great. And and Lindsay? Yeah, that was a good summary. Thank you, Rob. And just to um, clarify on the um, that canopy question and the elevation that I was suggesting may be helpful to look at. Um, Erica, do you have any thoughts on what we would propose there? You know, with the, the, the glass volume, I think a, a solid canopy would actually be pretty nice right there, kind of break up that expanse of, of glass. And then it provides an opportunity to provide some really solid downlighting. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the description that was provided sounds good, but maybe when um, this team comes back to present signage, we could see a render of that uh, back entrance. That's what I was thinking as well. If if that can be part of the sign review, um, <clears throat> to have an elevation and a description of that particular area 
um, of a building that would be helpful. And perhaps if possible, um, a rendering or something that shows the sight line toward that entrance. I think that was not completely um, clear from, from what was shown tonight, what that approach really looks like. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that would be great to see. All right, so can I ask for a motion to uh, approve the design proposal for the Jones Library with recommendations from someone on our committee, please. I so move. And a second? Second. Thanks, Pat. Uh, all right, all those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Wonderful, that's a unanimous. Thank you all for your hard work on this and for your super clear presentation this evening and for showing up. <laughs> Erica, may I just take a moment to thank you all um, for the care that you have shown um, and the time that you put in. Public service in this town is a gift to all of us. And I wanna thank you for giving that gift. Uh, tonight I am going to sleep with something that Lindsay said. She said, this is very exciting to see. So thank you for that gift to my sleep. You're very welcome. And it's a gift to all of us that you're doing this beautiful work. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much for your very thoughtful time and comments. We very much appreciate that. Thank you. Great, great. All right, you're welcome to stick around. I think we're gonna move on now um, on the agenda to uh, the public comment period. I noticed that we do have a number of people um, uh, from the general public with us this evening and wanna make sure that um, we hear what they have to say. Uh, so if anybody would like to make a comment, um, please go ahead and raise your hand um, and Rob can give you the floor. Uh, so we sure to so we do have one person, uh, Hilda Greenbaum, who I'm going to give um, speaking permissions to right now. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road, and I'm covering this meeting for the Indy, but I'm speaking for myself. I'm very disappointed that you didn't ask for public comment before you took your vote. There may have been people who had things they wanted to say. And... Uh, I really feel that even though they had the big open house and everybody giving comments that the public comment hasn't been listened to very carefully or incorporated in any of the designs. So I'm not going to bother saying anything because I don't want to rain on your parade. But it would have been good if, if there were people who wanted to say something that they had the opportunity. Thank you, Hilda. All right, then we have uh, one more person, Hetty Startup. Don't know who that is, but I can give him speaking permissions. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Great, that's great. Um, I'm particularly interested in the majority of comments about how the new edition um, is re respectful of the 1928 building. Um, it's my observation that the massing and volume of the addition on the um, North Prospect side is actually pretty, pretty big in comparison to the um, historic building, the 1928 building. And I'm a little concerned about the dimensions and proportions of the dormer windows in the upper level, even though I'm sure it makes for a very beautiful light interior space. Um, so that's one thing I'd love some feedback about. Um, I'm also speaking as a, an architectural historian in town. Um, I've been writing for 
um, one of the online magazines in Amherst um, about historic preservation. And it was a really exciting discovery to me to find out that a very beautiful fan-shaped window from the Chandler House, from the Whipple House on um, Pleasant Street was incorporated into the edition, the 1990-93 edition, in what is currently the study collections of the Jones Library. I'm very concerned that that window is now in jeopardy because it clearly falls in the category of building fabric that will be removed. And so those are my two comments for today. I would say um, by way of explanation that I'm taking a tour with um, Mr. Faber um, soon. <laughs> and I look forward to uh, seeing more um, in detail about what's going on and what the current conditions are. I mean, I'm a very avid library patron and I love our Jones Library um, and all the people who work in it and use it um, as much as I can. Um, and I think that it's been very helpful for me to hear the Design Review Board make all these comments um, and observations. I think um, we'll end up with something better as a result. Um, I am also familiar with the Holyoke Library and I love what Jim and all of you did. Um, did there. So um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask some questions. We appreciate your comments, Minnie. Thank you. Rob, a couple more hands. So no more hands from people in attendance, but we have two panelists who are with us right now from the uh, um, Applicate, sorry, the applicant who just spoke, uh, if you wanted to have them address any comments. Yes, uh, there's no requirement to address public comment, but if you have something that you'd like to, to add to provide some context, you're welcome to. Um, so I think Rachel's hand was up first. Oh, you're I muted. Expect, yeah. I expect Jim has the same response, so I'll let him speak to the Whipple window. Oh, uh, interesting. We were just discussing that again this afternoon and realized that it is, you know, an important artifact that had been moved to the previous edition. And we we're looking for a way to incorporate that into the design. Uh, we are thinking it may be something that we uh, locate in the main reading room or one of the large reading rooms and really are able then to interpret it you know, through some information in the room itself. Uh, it doesn't work well on the exterior of the building and the design at this point, but we think it can be incorporated nicely into the interior somewhere. So that, that's our thinking. So I think I think that's the latest, Rachel, but you may have more than no <laughs> more than I. You said it better than I could. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. So that's the plan. We're 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 aware of it and we are looking for the right spot. Thank you, Jim and Rachel, for, for adding on to, to that comment. So Hedy did um, raise her hand back up again if you wanted to give her a second uh, chance to speak, but it's totally up to you, Erica. Oh, happy to. We'll just um, okay. hear Hedy's comment and then we'll move on. Yep. Thanks very much. Um, I also was wondering if you could just address the the thought process behind the contemporary barrel vault that I'm seeing on the North Prospect side, even given that you've trimmed up the Norway spruce tree, um, I'd still like to hear a little bit more about the fenestration, the, the standing seam metal roof, great idea for New England, but it's not slate, is it? <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just, uh, looking for a little bit more information at this point about that. Thank you. Well, I'll just point out that I I think our design team has largely left the building at the moment. Um, but if 
Rachel or Jim or Sharon had anything quick to add, I think that we could spend a few minutes on it here, but there's... Maybe just a simple comment. I think partly the medal was to to really stand in a way in, in contrast to the original building. I think we, we've tried hard to let the original building, the 1928 building, stand on its own so that the the idea of the using a contemporary material it sort of ties in with the idea of the brick or the siding uh that makes it a little bit of a background i think to the to the original building so uh otherwise i i think you know, the other aspects you know are, are similarly being thought out is to make it contemporary without you know getting too close to the original so but i think really that's probably all i would say to that All right. Well, barring any, and thank you, Jim, and thank you, Hetty, for your uh, additional question. Barring any other um, comments, we will move the agenda along. I'm mindful of everyone's time this evening, um, longer than many of our design review board meetings have been lately. Um, we will uh, move forward to uh, approval of July meeting minutes. And um, DRB folks, should I share my screen or did you have a chance to review those? I I looked at them, but you're welcome to share. And Pat wasn't here. Um, yeah. So I so can't comment on them. You don't have much to say. Um, Catherine, did you get a chance to review? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, uh, any edits or barring that uh, approval uh, movement uh, move sorry motion to approve. Uh, I move that we approve the minutes of the July what what twenty fourth July twenty fourth July twenty fourth uh, meeting. I just was trying to remember. Maybe it's just me that July feels like ancient history <laughs> was the did the white lion brewing did they present twice they did they came back to present their outdoor yep. furniture plan okay that's why so was essentially because i was like fixing I up we talked a lot about the graphics on the front door but i couldn't remember if that was that's why it feels so long ago is because that was a previous meeting and it's not reflected in the comments because it wasn't part of this so that was my only clarification for myself was just to make sure that i was remembering somewhat that there was a previous meeting where the other components were addressed um in which case i second Catherine's motion fantastic all those in favor please say aye aye and one abstention pat fantastic abstain yeah um great so approved uh and then, of course, the next uh, item on the agenda is just anything uh, unanticipated and barring nothing, uh, we can move to adjourn. Chris or Rob, anything for us to think about? So we adjourn. I just want to say thank you, Erica. That was really well managed from my perspective and could have been a really challenging um meeting and i think it was handled really really well as always um well thank time. you all for doing your homework mm -hmm. that made the conversation move really quickly <laughs> and, and, yeah and having the site the site sorry uh, the site walk was really helpful rob thank you for organizing that yeah i apologize for having to leave early um but um i'm glad you guys benefited from going on this site walk um and i'm excited to see uh, what they propose in their updated plans. Um, I'm I'm actually curious to see what the um, north entrance is going to look like because you're right, they didn't show anything about that um, canopy at all. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like it was a pretty glaring kind of like piece that wasn't really presented. Um, that's really important. So I I appreciate you representing that in their summary. And and I'll echo Lindsay, Erica, thank you for a very well-run meeting. And um, 
it's it's a great introduction for me to this board to have meetings so well organized and 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 the agenda so so distinct. So thank you. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, we're you know, not quite as tight as the planning board. I I like to leave some room for discussion when we can, and um, so just to again back at you all with um appreciation for having reviewed all the documents because it was a pretty hefty package. So. Yeah. I think a question for Chris um, regarding Hilda's comment. Is it best to uh, do it the way we did it, where we uh, respond um, based on what we've discussed and then allow the public to speak? Or should we, in the future, allow the public to speak before giving our final response? I think it's probably a good idea to allow the public to speak before you give your final um, recommendations only because then they feel that they really have been heard mm -hmm. um, and they feel that their ideas might somehow influence your recommendations. Maybe they would and maybe they wouldn't, but I think it just allows them to feel heard. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my only thought. Yeah, I, re I respect that comment and I, um, it was an oversight on my part just because the kind of the meeting agenda puts the public comment was at the end and the technically public comment is about things that are not on the agenda. Uh, but of course, in this case, you know, folks do have things to say. And I think that that's important. There have been so many opportunities for the public to, to weigh in. Um, I was just, I it was an oversight. So the way the planning board handles it is when they're having a meeting about a project, they take public comment on that project. And then they have a separate time where they take public comment about things in general. So that's a suggestion that you might consider. Yeah, I think we'll incorporate that in the future. All right. Okay. So can we re-motion to adjourn? And <laughs> I will re-motion <laughs> that we adjourn. Okay. Great. Okay. Good night, everybody, and thanks Good night. for your Good time. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay.